So it's lovely to meet you. Who are you? Right. Well, I that's a great question. Every morning I wake up and I look outside the window and notice what the sky is doing, notice how the trees are moving, how the seasons are evolving. And I'm reminded just how remarkably unlikely it is that we're all here from almost every point of view and that we get a chance to share this journey together and try to understand what it means to be a conscious being. So I take that um, kind of thinking to my art studio where I'm a painter and a video artist and director of Sky Day, which is a, an educational uh, platform and a not-for-profit. Uh, and we have the mission of engaging the next generation globally in an inspiring conversation about our sky and how it functions and importantly, what its vulnerabilities are and promote the idea that it's extremely important that the next generation come together as one global family living and breathing under one shared sky to work together on climate. Your main inspirations um, for your um, project um, are Yo-Yo Ma and also very early on uh, your father. Um, yeah and his documentary, The Choice. Could you talk to us about yeah. that? Yeah, so um, back in the 70s, uh, when I was very young, um, my dad made a film, uh, a documentary called The Choice. It was about pollution of air and water. Um, and I remember when he came home, having interviewed experts and listened to what they were telling him about the implications of our practices, that he was dismayed at what he'd learned. And talking about our environment, thinking about our impact on it, um, ever since then has become something of a family conversation, always was. So in 2013, when I attended Ideas Fest um, and heard many great uh, conversations from some extraordinary people, um, Yo-Yo Ma was there, um, and he was speaking at Ideas Fest about um, his ideas of um, moving curriculum from STEM to STEAM. Um, but also um, what struck me um, greatly was his ideas about the role of a citizen artist. How can we, those of us in the arts, um, use you know whatever talents we got to serve the next generation by engaging them uh, and inspiring them on something that matters a great deal to us. And I was really inspired by him. Um, he's an extraordinary human being, of course, Yo-Yo Ma. Um, serious people are thinking of him as perhaps being the greatest artist of our time, like Leonardo da Vinci great, because he has such breadth of talents, both in his arts, um, as a cellist, of course, and as a composer, I believe he composes as well, um, but also as a humanitarian and all the extraordinary work he's doing to help young people. Um, he certainly has my vote. There, sort of in his company, I had something of an idea, a bit of a vision for how I might help. I, had the idea that we would invite people all over the world, especially our young people, to take a few minutes to look at the sky, think about how beautiful it is, but beautiful not just to look at how dynamic it is, how it connects us all by wrapping completely around our planet as one global family living and breathing under one shared sky, how it isn't something high up there away from us, but it's all around us. It's in your home. It's in my art studio, it's in our schools, it's the air we breathe, it's the water we drink, and how as a natural resource, um, we live in such great proximity to it. The sky, our atmosphere, is the one natural resource that we all truly experience and share. You can't really say that about rainforest experience or ocean experience or desert experience, but we can absolutely all say it about sky experience. All we have to do is look up and breathe in. That's how close we live in proximity to it. And that also teaches us 
but we all have a responsibility to it because we all impact it. Um, every one of us is in the room uh, of people who must go to work to take care of this great resource for everyone's benefit. And I thought about inviting everyone to photograph the sky while they think about those things and then help create a global citizen artwork, a global mosaic of our sky um, that would show what the sky looks like all over the world and could conceivably become um, a library of sky photos that could be formed the basis of an interactive educational platform. That was my sort of original idea. So you're creating um, awe and uh, encouraging children uh, and by association adults to uh, wonder at the world, to wonder at the sky in, in ways that they have not done until now. Um, what action would you like to happen as a result of this? Um, sure. Yes, as an artist, um, it is um, very valuable to uh, encourage people to stop in their tracks, to, to look up, to appreciate. But what are you going to do about making people behave differently? Our society change our ways. I mean, Donald Trump. Um, has exited out of the Paris uh, Agreement, climate change mm -hmm. agreement. Um, that's not good for um, the whole movement. Um, what sort of action do you think needs to happen? And what, what part would you like to play in that? As an artist, and Yo-Yo Ma speaks to this, um, is it sensible for people like me to just stand on the sidelines and not try to help? Um, or do we have a responsibility to try to help? So the first step was accepting that responsibility that if there was a way that art and science combined could be purposeful and could help create uh, substantial change, um, I wanted to give it my best. Um, Acknowledging, of course, that you can't paint away the carbon in the atmosphere and a poem cannot wish away um, all the damage that we are doing. The second thing to say is that uh, we are non-political as an organization. Why? Because we want to invite everybody to connect to our sky and to think about these things. And as soon as one becomes political, um, one becomes divisive. We're not affiliated with any political group, certainly not any American political group. We are a global organization um, that tries to uh, talk about this without getting into politics. So the question is, what do we want to achieve in terms of outcomes? Well, um, while we are not aligned with any political group, we think it's very important that when people become adults um, and think about how they're going to conduct themselves as parts of the community, for those who live in countries that can vote, uh, we want to urge them to have the education that they need in order to be able to understand the implications of what their vote means regarding climate change and to vote for leaders who are offering substantial ideas about what they intend to do to help us transition from unsustainable economies and businesses to sustainable ones. So voting intelligently with real information for those who can vote is a significant goal of ours. And thinking about how one can work oneself towards a sustainable future, how can our young people become leaders in the sustainable revolution? Because one of the things we are arguing strongly, because it's absolutely true, is that the inevitable transition from unsustainable economies to sustainable ones is the absolutely the greatest opportunity of their lives. Because everybody's going to need it. It's opportunities for new leadership, for innovation, for new businesses, 
and also ultimately for a new definition of citizen, what it means to be a global ecological citizen. to um, interviewing you, I, had a, I reacquainted myself with the Sustainable Development Goals and um, it was quite interesting because uh, your focus at the moment is the sky and yeah. um, two, well, two of the Sustainable Development Goals, one is uh, life uh, under the water, uh, another one is uh, life on earth. And the third one out of the 17 is uh, climate change. And I just thought a very interesting thing would be to use this initiative, <laughs> maybe inappropriate to say this now, um, to, to lobby for uh, life in the sky. Wow, what an interesting to, idea. To, to add an 18th sustainable development initiative. But that was just in passing. And um, I, possibly it would bring the whole thing into the political arena, but uh, many different uh, nations are involved at the United Nations. So um, yeah. it's a very interesting um, question. Uh, <laughs> something to think about. <laughs> yes. Um, but... When I think about um, by sky, of course, we're conflating climate and yes, atmosphere. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah with with yes. something that is difficult to argue with our sky yes. is absolutely beautiful yes. um and and of course it's an, an ancient word comes from the old norwegian i believe it is old norse um i should say uh, meaning you know the place where clouds hang out and birds fly through um atmosphere really um and and to me the atmosphere is key to everything because all that we are doing goes into the atmosphere and, and, and from that relationship of atmosphere to planet, things result. So, um, but I take your point, good point. And there are microorganisms that live in the sky. There really is life in the sky. They don't just Earth, move and through and then land down on Earth again. Indeed, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, fascinating. Anyway, it yeah. just struck me. Um, <laughs> so, Tell us a little bit more about your uh, passion for light. Yes, well, um, light is, it seems to me, everything. Um, Brian Cox, um, the great physicist, um, has made a series of videos on light, and, and I'll be paraphrasing him um, here. But, um, you know, if you imagine about evolution and how we came to be what we are, um, light is a key to all of it. Um, those early grubs that crawled around our planet that didn't have photosensitive cells would have had no idea when something was coming to eat it uh, and would have not have understood uh, why it's warm during the day and cold at night. Um, but with those first photoreceptive cells um, came a chance to avoid being eaten and avoid and perhaps find better food and as he describes it led to an evolutionary arms race centered on the eye you know bigger eyes more eyes eyes all over the, the body practically um, extraordinary evolution of the eye and today because we have eyes and can see light we can see each other and come to know one another uh, we can see why the uh, day is warmer because we can see the sun and at night we know why it's cooler and at night we can see the stars and see how vast everything is and today we can even measure the age of the light and understand how old everything is which gives us a whole other perspective on who we are in relation to everything else it's because of light that we're able to articulate our way in life and with each other in community and on this planet. And I find uh, light not only beautiful, but terrific in the way it reveals. So yeah. don't just bring this alive in your painting. You uh, have more recently brought this alive in your um, video work, Revolutions. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, revolutions um, were something of a first. I created in 2006, fully 24 hours long 
high definition digital videos all 68,400 consecutive seconds that comprise a day night cycle. Um, and I did so because as I was standing on a lake preparing for a solo show at the Grand Rapids Art Museum of paintings, um, I was dealing with the thing that all of us who paint out of doors deal with, which is the frustrating speed with which light changes and wondering if there was another way to convey the experience that I was seeing. All those moment to moment causal relationships that result in the way things are experienced. And it occurred to me standing on the banks of this river that it would be great if I could create a video of this that unlike time elapsed art, which takes frames in a certain amount of period of time and then plays it back more quickly, giving the appearance of time passing more quickly, that we, I could create a, a sort of projection that would be like a living window or a living canvas in which everything evolved and moved um, in real time. In 2003, when I began to think about this, there didn't seem to be a way to pull it off. Um, but after a few years of experimentation in 2006, I was able to create the first one and then made a few more, including one at Central Park of the light changing there. Which was and Stonehenge as well, I believe. Yeah, that was terrific to spend four days and nights um, with the stones. Um, a powerful experience. And mm. it was around solstice. So at 4 or 4.30 in the morning, I was surprised, as were the Druids who arrived surprised when almost 200 of them, led by their Grand Master, arrived wondering what on earth I was doing and me just astounded they were there but they were absolutely amazing it was beautiful to yes. be able to be witness to this event and uh, that was a, a beautiful experience and um, it was interesting um, because when I, um, I I watched that particular video um, what had occurred to me apart from um, the 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 summer season video of four seasons where you see a man or a woman coming into view and swimming with I think a seal behind them. Um, the thing that occurred to me is that uh, neither people nor buildings uh, um, seem to appear in your paintings or videos. It, it's it's a rare sighting. Uh, can you yeah. explain about that? In my art in general, I want to focus on the other. Um, there's a great deal of art, and brilliant art, being created um, about us, about the body, about our relationship to each other, about the human experience uh, in relation to each other. But I wanted to turn my attention elsewhere and to examine the um, way our environment moves and flows as if you were the first person to see it and you were alone seeing it and really meditating on it. talk about your um, further influences, for example, um, Maya sure. Angelou and Vera sure. Clement, and how they sure. have impacted your life, and, um, uh, and also how you paint, your approach to art. Uh, I was fortunate enough that I was a student at Wake Forest University, which is a terrific school in North Carolina, that they um, hired Dr. Angelo, my Angelo, um, to teach when I was a student there. What an extraordinary and lucky opportunity for me. Um, and I took a class with her um, and was astounded at what an amazing human being she is. Um, what a powerful, thoughtful, wise, creative force. Um, and a generous person, it turned out. Um, long after the class was over, um, I was allowed to uh, visit her and ask her advice about things. She mentored me. An amazing person who taught me many, many things. But at the heart of her teaching is this idea that we all share a core humanity. Such an important idea. Um, she would uh, often quote 
the great playwright Terence, who in one of his plays, uh, a slave says, Homo sum humani nihil a me alienum puto, which means I'm a human being. Nothing human can be alien to me. Mm. And in that one sentence, which she yes. would laugh about and say she wished she'd written, <laughs> she, saw, she saw the simplest description of what our core humanity is all about. Yes, we, yes. each of us as human beings, cannot possibly not understand another human being's experience. Um, it had a huge impact on me as an, an idea, and she is a tremendous artist. And Vera Clement, who here in Chicago is an extraordinary painter, perhaps our greatest. I've had some tremendously powerful women who have been uh, influential in my development. It was extraordinary to be her student. Um, nobody has an eye quite like Vera Clement, uh, an eye in general and, and a, um, an intellect and a wisdom, uh, just extraordinary. And she pushed me very hard to hone my skills and most of all, think about the relationship of, of skills and of painting to meaning and to uh, relevance. Um, the Sky Day project is uh, yeah. a major project for you, as we said earlier. Um, yeah. And uh, you have some uh, incredible people involved, in, including uh, from Daniel Horton right the way through to an amazing woman called Nicole Stott. Absolutely. Who wasn't yeah. recently a NASA astronaut and is now yeah. uh, an artist, a space artist. She calls herself yeah. the artistic astronaut. Um, yes. So you have um, amazing support um, and interest there. Um, what yeah. are the barriers to achieving what you would like to achieve next? Wow. What are the barriers? Yes. The barriers are the human being and the time we live in. Um, we are all incredibly busy and inundated with input. So engagement of any kind, no matter how important the subject, and, and let's face it, uh, there are a few things in actual fact that are more important than the impact we're having on climate. If we don't um, come together truly as one global family and help each other with empathy and with thought and with effort and with wisdom and with creativity and with innovation. If we don't come together in those ways and create substantial change, um, we're not going to like it. Our children aren't going to like it. Our grandchildren are going to be miserable because they will be dealing with a laundry list of outcomes. The question is, how do we engage people on that in a way that creates substantial change? And the first obstacle is cutting through all the noise and some of the deceptions and getting people's attention. The problem is that casual engagement is very hard in and of itself. And I think if you were to ask most people um, who are educated and who understand what science really is, who understand that the same science that works your toaster and makes your car work and keeps airplanes in the air is screaming at us that climate change is happening and that the evidence is overwhelming and that the implications are astounding. Um, but if you would ask most people who have been educated, um, they will tell you they care about climate change. If you ask them if they care about their parents, they'll probably say, yeah, of course I do. And then you ask them how often they see them, <laughs> they might be like, uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> so caring and acting, creating substantial change, uh, is another whole level of obstacle. So I would say that education is a major obstacle, but Getting attention in the right way is a major obstacle. I just told you, as you all know, as I'm sure everyone listening knows, the laundry list, I didn't even begin, did I? I didn't mention polar bears or melting ice caps, but I, we could go on for hours. And it's just depressing. 
and it makes people feel helpless because we know we all have to do this together. We know not everybody is doing this together. It's not great dinner conversation. Who wants to have that kind of a conversation with your kids? It's not considered great parenting to give your children a, a bucket load of anxiety with no hope and solution for the future. So it's, it's an easy conversation to avoid. Engagement of any kind, even casual engagement, is difficult. Engagement that leads to substantial change is really difficult. And I don't have an answer yet. Um, we've created engagement. We were astounded that when we did, so, so, so Sky Day is, is the name of our organization. It's also a date on the calendar. It's September the 21st. And, and this is a day of contemplation and engagement in our sky, a day of reflection on, on what it is, what the science is of what's going on up there, why you should care, what the implications are, and what we need to do about it. Um, using uh, through various kinds of engagements and um, uh, but uh, so we're beginning this process and uh, you're right I have an amazing team that includes um, Daniel Horton who leads the research group at Northwestern University the climate research group you mentioned Nicole Stott an extraordinary human being who's experienced our planet from the depths of the oceans because she's also a NASA aquanaut as if she you know that all the other things she does wasn't enough <laughs> And she's experienced our planet from the depths of the oceans to the heights of outer space and uh, talks beautifully about the implications of those kinds of experience to her. And it creates a great love in her for the planet and of people. Don Webbles is on our team, uh, a leading atmospheric scientist who's a lead author for the IPCC. And there's nobody who knows more about climate and atmosphere than he. Um, he's his uh, uh, panel, the IPCC, was even awarded a Nobel Peace Prize for their work in 2007. Extraordinary person to have on our team. And we also have um, Dan Simpson and Sam Illingworth in England, um, both in Manchester, or Dan's actually in London, I believe, two poets, scientists, who care a great deal about these issues. So our goal is to, to talk to not just each other, but any scientist or educator or artist who has an idea about how we can engage the next generation um, in projects that will be both inspiring and informative and help create substantive change. I, I wish I had a silver bullet for it. I wish I could paint away the carbon in the atmosphere. But if we can encourage people, as we were saying, to vote with education and also to seize the opportunities, the many opportunities that sustainable economy presents, um, that would be uh, terrific if we can be helpful along that path. So you're reaching uh, out across the world with this yeah. idea. Um, yeah. Empathy is important for you and uh, particularly empathy for our planet and its systems. Um, you're supporting and bringing alive a very big and important idea. Um, I'm interested in, uh, along your human journey, who, who empathised with you? Who supported you at the important mm. times to propel you forward? What a great question. Well, we've mentioned um, Dr. Angelo and Vera Clement, both of whom absolutely um, did that. Um, the first person to do so was an art teacher in, in London at Pimlico School, where I went to school, called Helena Vavskevich, who had um, escaped from Auschwitz herself and was an extraordinarily passionate woman who uh, insisted on, on sort of the, the propelling me forward into the arts. But I would have to say that my wife um, is an extraordinarily um, supportive, intelligent, thoughtful person who challenges me to think about how I can be as purposeful um, and helpful as I can with this work. Neither of us wants to um, uh, create an organization, and she's on our board, um, and really is the person who gave me the courage to try. Um, and, and, and to be useful for a moment, um, and to pass on something she's taught me to our audience. Um, 
she she points out regularly to me when I am struck by the fact that I don't really know how to do what it is I'm trying to do, that I am searching for answers and searching for uh, uh, ideas, um, that that's just the way it is in life when you're trying to do something difficult that maybe hasn't been done before. And as uh, she says, you, you learn a little and you take a step and you learn a little more and you take another step. And there is no other way to move forward. Um, so um, frankly, without her uh, encouragement and, and her wisdom and her intelligence to speak to uh, um, and to trust, um, I wouldn't have had the courage to, to do this. Um, so you are surrounded by amazing people, both uh, professionally and personally. I am. Um, out of everybody that you could meet in the world, <laughs> who you haven't met so far, wow. who, whom would you like to meet and what person, and what question would you like to ask that person? What a fabulous question. Um, uh, thinking about the living for a moment um, and thinking about what I most would like to meet and ask. It would be any artist, scientist or educator who has an, an idea for how we can serve the next generation globally through some kind of art science initiative. Um, I would love to speak to you and, and perhaps collaborate with you. We would love that as an organization at Sky Day. Um, that would be terrific. And then thinking about people who aren't around anymore and assuming that they would like to talk to me. <laughs> Big assumption. Um, I would love to, I would always love to have had a chance to speak to George Harrison oh. uh, and John Lennon. Um, both, of their, uh, both of them um, were huge influences on me as a young person through their music, of course, but also through their conversations um, which, of course, I only experienced through television and videos. Um, but um, I am incredibly impressed with their um, talent and with their ability to tap into truth and meaning and love uh, through their art. Um, wow. If they were interested in talking to me, I'd love to <laughs> talk to them. And what would you ask them? Help. What would you like to ask them? Is there a particular question? Yeah, I'd like to ask them uh, how they became so brave um, and how they stuck with it and uh, how they dealt uh, and how they um, conceived of things, how they worked through ideas, how they recognized good ones and discarded the not so good. Yeah, I would love to talk to them about that. Ben Whitehouse, artist and founder of Sky Day Project. Thank you very much for your time. It's been right. an absolute pleasure. You're so kind. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you.